So uh, the discussion for Mech Minute in June is really part two of a discussion we started last month on EMS and infectious disease. So I want to spend um, the first five or six slides just kind of reviewing what we've already talked about last month, and then I'll move on to the rest of the discussion. Um, what are we, uh, we going to talk about? Um, again, this is a two-part series, and uh, the focus is on increasing awareness of EMS providers uh, regarding the risk of uh, uh, contagious diseases and uh, how they can reduce their risk of contracting an illness that may be um, uh, had by one of their patients. Um, post, most of our patients do not represent a significant infectious disease risk, which uh, tends to make us a little um, uh, reluctant to think about or uh, makes us kind of uh, not think about um, infectious disease risk uh, to ourselves and our um, uh, co-workers. Uh, and most infectious diseases if caught by an EMS provider are inconvenient but not a, a health uh, threat to the provider. And examples of this are upper respiratory infections or diseases that uh, or illnesses that involve nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. There are, however, some rare uh, diseases out there that represent a substantial risk to you as a healthcare provider. Uh, and and uh, these diseases are, are still out there uh, despite the best of public health efforts. Uh, examples include tuberculosis, uh, measles, uh, meningococcal disease, which can be manifested as either uh, meningitis or as sepsis. And then the ultimate concern is Ebola, which so far has been uh, contained to uh, West Africa. <clears throat> uh, the risk to you can be uh, mitigated or eliminated if you follow correct uh, uh, procedures for uh, personal protective of equipment and as well as uh, hand hygiene and so on. Uh, and, and really a lot of what I like to talk about today is just changing your mindset so you can uh, think about and identify high risk patients and then have some idea of what PPE is required. Uh, the basis of our conversation has been this monograph, which I distributed last month and will distribute again this month along with uh, this discussion. Uh, it was issued by ASPR uh, and uh, it was just uh, released uh, late last year. It's a great resource. It's an easy read. It breaks things down based upon um, types of precautions that are required. Uh, just kind of a sideline comment, uh, some of the levels of PPE required or suggested by this monograph uh, exceed what we recommend as part of our infection control policy. Uh, that predominantly has to do with um, how and when masks are used on the providers or patients. And uh, based on consultation with our infectious disease consultant, um, uh, we don't think an N95 mask is uh, required for um, our patient care. Uh, and that's because of um, uh, relative short period of time we may be exposed to our patients. And uh, for the more highly infectious uh, diseases, uh, face shield may be recommended, which then also reduces the need for an N95 mask. Some other general comments. Uh, our primary purpose of this conversation is to uh, uh, increase your awareness of, uh, of infectious disease and risk to you. Uh, again, in certain cases, uh, there may be a little discrepancy between um, the ASPR uh, document and what we have in our infection control manual. Uh, in case of uh, conflict, uh, the infection control manual uh, rules. Um, future infectious disease outbreaks may uh, bring revised recommendations for PPE, uh, and we will have to make adjustments as information becomes available um, and as recommended, uh, or as change is uh, to recommended PEBE uh, comes out through uh, CDC or other applicable uh, entities. And then uh, be aware of what's happening in your neighborhoods and consider populations you serve. Immigrant populations are more likely to suffer some infections that are uncommon to Ohio. Examples include uh, tuberculosis and uh, measles, and uh, often uh, outbreaks are uh, well publicized through DC, CDC and local media. Uh, if that occurs, um, we'll keep you appraised. Probably the most significant outbreak that we always have every year is influenza, in which case the best thing you can do is to have your influenza vaccine and uh, practice um, uh, good hygiene and uh, as appropriate uh, mask yourself and, and or the patient. Some, uh, again, infectious diseases that provide risk to you. Uh, some of these are fairly um, esoteric, but still out there. Anthrax, we're aware of. Diphtheria or whooping cough has made a comeback because of um, reduced immunity in adults because their vaccinations wear off. Uh, influenza, we're well aware of. 
Uh, measles is, a, is an issue, particularly in some of the immigrant populations uh, where uh, children and adults may not be as well vaccinated uh, because measles uh, really is non-existent in our country except in non-vaccinated people. A meningococcal disease uh, is a terrible disease. It's more common in military recruits and college campuses, uh, but it still happens in our communities. German measles or rubella is, is rare. Um, smallpox is currently non-existent in the United States, but it is a, a potential biological weapon that can be used. Uh, MRSA is everywhere. It's probably the most common infectious disease we see that's bacterial uh, and uh, for which we are most likely to be colonized or infected. Um, think about it in anybody with abscess formation or someone who uh, is a intravenous drug user. Viral hemorrhagic fevers are the really bad ones. That's Ebola and Marburg. Uh, there's hepatitis A, B, and C. There has been a recurrence of hepatitis A in the United States, also known as uh, infectious hepatitis. Generally, uh, does not result in long-term disability or impairment, but um, uh, it, it can be a very uncomfortable disease to have uh, for uh, three to four weeks. Uh, vaccines are available, and uh, occasionally uh, mass vaccination programs are held because of outbreaks in the community. Hepatitis B for us is no longer a significant concern, in part because we're all vaccinated uh, and also because most of the population has been vaccinated. Uh, hepatitis C is a real concern. It's probably the most common form of hepatitis that I see, and it's often associated with intravenous uh, drug use or multiple sex partners. Uh, mumps is a, uh, a viral illness that we occasionally see. Uh, pertussis um, is also an, an illness out there. And actually, I misspoke earlier. Uh, pertussis is whooping cough. Um, diphtheria is is uh, is not whooping cough. But diphtheria and pertussis are all part of the diphtheria, pertussis, and uh, tetanus vaccine that most of us uh, receive. Streptococcal disease like strep pharyngitis uh, or strep throat is out there. Uh, rhinovirus, which is the common cold, and then there's also the norovirus, which has to do with um, norovirus, which is what commonly causes illness on cruise ships uh, and uh, can be a debilitating illness uh, if you contract it. And uh, it is uh, transmitted by oral fecal routes, so good hand hygiene uh, is, is very important in preventing spread of this illness. Uh, responder actions, what should you do? Uh, vigilance is paramount. Uh, you have to think about uh, risk to yourself and others and um, think about infectious diseases. Uh, scene size up is important if the patient has respiratory symptoms um, uh, and you're at risk for infectious disease. Uh, stay back until you have a better idea of what uh, PPE is needed and you have appropriate PPE on yourself or on or on the patient, and for the patient that usually means a mask uh, for respiratory illness. Um, uh, you also have to be aware that sometimes your uh, PPE may cause patient or family anxiety. Uh, it's best to advise the patient and family what you're going to do and why you're going to do it uh, and be prepared to uh, address their concerns that may come with it. Uh, use the surgical mask liberally in terms of masking your patients who have a uh, cough. Uh, this will do a lot to uh, reduce uh, risk of spread of the infectious agents. Uh, protect your eyes and mucous membranes, particularly if you're doing airway procedures, which could include giving bronchodilators via nebulizer. And then uh, follow correct donning and doffing procedures uh, when putting on PPE. Uh, if there is a high risk or a outbreak of a high risk uh, infectious disease in the community and uh, PPE may be required that you're not used to using, that I would suggest you practice uh, doffing and donning PPE uh, before you have a run where you need to use it. And then always remember good high hand hygiene before and after patient contact. Uh, again, a review of on-scene actions, prepare for situations based on information from dispatch, uh, apply PPE as appropriate, um, stay back until you know uh, what level of PPE is required. If uh, you have a suspicion of a significant illness, um, make sure you notify additional incoming providers of the need for PPE uh, before they uh, enter the room or assist with patient care. Uh, for severe GI symptoms, consider use of an emesis bag or absorbent undergarment, uh, such as Depends. Uh, you may need to put a pad, absorbent pad, under the patient on the gurney. Uh, for some symptoms that are really severe, particularly if conditions such as uh, Ebola uh, or hemorrhagic viral uh, fever is a concern, um, it may be appropriate to place the patient in an impervious gown or coveralls so that uh, patient secretions are contained within uh, that uh, 
piece of clothing. And again, uh, if necessary, notify the receiving facility of any isolation needs. So if you think the patient may have TB or meningitis or any of the severe infections, uh, advise the receiving facility ahead of time. Uh, most of these patients just need to be in a private room or a cubicle, uh, but some patients need to be in a negative pressure room, and uh, often those rooms are in use with other patients, so the facility may need time to clear the room and get it ready for your patient. Just a quick uh, review of uh, some symptoms and what diseases you may think about based upon, you know, is it a GI illness? Uh, is it a flu-like illness, a cough or respiratory illness? Is there a skin infection? Uh, or has there been any history of prior antibiotic use or resistance? Uh, and, um, you know, that will all help you make a decision regarding potential causes. Um, and most of these conditions can be safely managed with contact precautions. Um, some patients need um, droplet or uh, more aggressive uh, procedures. Levels of precautions. Last month we talked about standard and contact precautions. This month we're going to talk about droplet precautions uh, and on down. I'll give you a little more detail on special respiratory precautions and uh, the hemorrhagic fevers, um, particularly in terms of uh, the risk to you. So droplet precautions, generally these are infectious uh, organisms that can be spread by large droplets, uh, by coughing, vomiting, uh, or nebulized treatments um, have to be a concern if you're providing uh, airway maneuvers or if you have to intubate the patient. Uh, examples include meningococcal disease, which is either meningitis or sepsis, um, mumps, so the patient may have big swollen uh, uh, salivary glands just in front of the ears, uh, pertussis or whooping cough, uh, German measles, influenza, and strep throat. Um, for the dispatcher, typically, um, you know, we get uh, pre-arrival instructions from them and advise the crew of any infectious disease. You know, dispatchers in the past um, have done some call screening uh, so that we have a better idea of what we're dealing with. Um, if you can recall back when Ebola, Ebola was a concern, we had our dispatchers uh, asking about fever and travel on all calls, uh, which uh, was a way of screening for infectious disease so you could uh, prepare ahead of time. For uh, patients who may have any of the illnesses I discussed, uh, and that includes influenza, which is probably the most common uh, uh, illness that we're going to have that is a potential risk to you uh, as an infection, uh, stay back until you have PPE on yourself or the patient. Um, surgical mask and gloves are appropriate. Um, and again, um, you know, uh, masking the patient will do a lot to reduce your risk of uh, contracting these illnesses. Uh, eye protection uh, or face shield while performing airway uh, interventions or administering uh, nebulized medications. Uh, be aware that if you have to intubate the patient, um, the patient can cough and get uh, secretions on you. Uh, so uh, for in terms of your actions, be aware of uh, local disease outbreaks like influenza. Uh, use gloves during patient contact. I think we've become very good at using gloves for just about every patient contact. Again, using goggles, face shield for airway procedures or a patient with active cough. Um, if you have to provide uh, an artificial airway or intubate the patient, uh, I would consider early use of uh, sedatives, uh, like ketamine and uh, paralytics so that the patient cough doesn't cough and your risk of exposure is less. And then again, uh, good hand hygiene. For the patient, again, surgical mask. Uh, if the patient's got a lot of uh, secretions coming from the nose and mouth, facial tissue uh, will help uh, control um, uh, transmission of illness. And then you may have to take those tissues and put them in a uh, bag or trash container so that it doesn't uh, spread through your vehicle. And again, minimize airway interventions to those that are absolutely needed. In terms of transporting the patient, uh, standard transport, uh, turn the vent fan on if it's not turned on already. And then if you have to decon your vehicle, um, you know, wipe off any gross contamination and then disinfect um, all potentially contaminated services and equipment utilizing the appropriate uh, identified disinfectant. Um, and again, the disinfectants are specific to your department based on what your agency has determined meets um, the standards. Airborne precautions. Uh, these are um, infections generally that are spread through aerosolized secretions, so there's uh, more fine particles than droplets, and these can spread within six feet, uh, generally, uh, of the uh, patient. 
The illnesses we worry about uh, are, are uh, tuberculosis, uh, chicken pox, and uh, measles, which is variola. Um, again, measles recently had an outbreak in some of the African immigrants um, in this country, and um, we do have some neighborhoods that have a high population of patients who have immigrated from Africa. Their vaccinations may not be current, um, so uh, in that population of patients to have an extra bit of caution. Tuberculosis is also a concern, particularly in patients who are medically indigent or homeless um, who have HIV disease um, or patients who have recently immigrated from uh, Africa or certain portions of Asia. Um, so have a high suspicion there for patients who are uh, coughing and have fever. Uh, again, from a dispatch perspective, um, you know, advise the crew of any uh, infectious disease uh, based on patient symptoms. Uh, always be aware of infectious disease breakouts. Again, as I alluded to multiple times, uh, think about the measles as an example. And stay back at least six feet before donning appropriate PPE or getting the patient masked. Uh, for... Uh, for you, your actions should be minimizing patient contact until PPE is on. You know, if you have a fire, you don't go in the building and, until your PPE is on. Same thing should uh, involve patient care. Uh, the the uh, handout that's part of this recommends an N95 mask. Our protocol suggests a surgical mask because we have relatively short-term exposures. Uh, healthcare inst institutions will use N95s or in some cases PAPRs, uh, and uh, that's because staff members have a longer uh, exposure time with the patients, which increases the risk of com uh, communicating or contracting the infectious disease. And then gloves, gloves, gloves with good ha uh, hand hygiene. For patient care, we can mask the patient. Again, we're going to avoid airway interventions, and if necessary, uh, or if airway interventions are necessary, we're going to use a face shield or mask or, or goggles. Uh, I suspect for most of it's going to be uh, putting a mask and goggles on ourselves. If the patient requires intubation, uh, we should use RSI to avoid patient coughing, which is only going to uh, spread the germs uh, throughout the truck or the room where you're working on the patient. And again, notify the receiving hospital of need for isolation. Uh, so if we have a patient with measles, a patient with... Um, uh, possible tuberculosis. They need to be in a negative pressure room and the hospitals need to prepare for it. Chicken pox is also a consideration um, and those patients will need to be in isolation and we need to be careful uh, with those patients around uh, other patients who may have uh, immune deficiency such as uh, current treatment for chemotherapy or with chemotherapy for cancer. For deconning the vehicle, again we use the appropriate uh, disinfectant um, and uh, I should have eliminated the part about C. diff, but um, uh, any, any contamination should be removed and then clean and disinfect the gurney um, with the appropriate disinfectant. Um, if you have a patient with chicken pox, um, uh, you uh, may need to be particularly careful with body secretions and um, that may need to have to go in a biohazard bag. I want to talk a little bit about special respiratory protection and viral uh, hemorrhagic fevers uh, in terms of risk, and you know these are the these are the uh, bugs that can kill you. Um, uh, special respiratory protection is required for um, three illnesses that are uh, for us fairly uh, exotic, um, but exist. Uh, and one of them, uh, SARS, was uh, pretty close to coming to the states because it actually had a outbreak in Toronto a number of years ago. But there are some illnesses that require special respiratory protection uh, because of the infectivity and the mortality of these uh, uh, illnesses. Uh, the recommendations are, are a little more strict than for the routine um, airborne uh, and droplet precautions. So MERS or the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, it's coming out of the um, Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean area, uh, it, kind of the uh, Arabic Peninsula. Uh, and it is a viral infection. Uh, it has about a 35% mortality rate for all infected patients. And for patients who become ill enough that they have to be placed on a ventilator, there's a 60 to 70% uh, 60 to 70% mortality rate. So this is a bad player, and we need to take extra precaution if we have any reason to suspect the patient may have this illness. So if you have a patient who um, recently traveled from the Arabic area and now has uh, respiratory symptoms with fever, you should consider MERS. Uh, periodically, we'll hear about um, outbreaks uh, in these areas through CDC or the World Health Organization. So again, it comes down to knowing what's out there. Uh, SARS, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, was an issue a number of years ago. Uh, primarily, it was an issue in, in uh, 
China, but it did spread to Toronto at one point. It has a 14 to 15 percent mortality rate, but if you're looking at patients over age 64, so 65 and up, there's about a 50 percent mortality rate uh, for SARS. Um, and there is also a significant risk of chronic respiratory symptoms in survivors. I know a physician who um, had been working and living in Ohio, but had to move to Florida after he had SARS because he developed significant respiratory complications and simply uh, cannot tolerate winters in Ohio anymore uh, because of his pulmonary problems. There's also an entity out there called novel influenza-like illness. Um, it's, it's an odd bird. Uh, occasionally you hear about it through CDC. I'm not aware of it being a significant threat at this time, but it also has about a 40% mortality rate. Um, so those are, the, those are the illnesses that are considered to be special or require special respiratory protection. We also have the viral hemorrhagic fevers. Uh, Ebola was the big scare a number of years ago, uh, but we also have Marburg virus and something called Lassa fever. Uh, Ebola uh, uh, has about a 50% average mortality rate, but depending on uh, where patients have been cared for, the rate, uh, death rate runs between 25 and 90%. So generally patients who have uh, better access to um, aggressive high quality medical care are more likely to survive, whereas those who do not are more likely to die. Marburg vi virus is another hemorrhagic fever. Uh, it has a mortality rate of uh, average about 50%, but it ranges from 24 to 88%, again, depending on what resources available for patient care. Uh, loss of fever uh, is predominantly uh, spread by um, rat urine and exposure to rat urine or dried rat urine, uh, but it can be spread uh, person to person. Uh, it generally has a low mortality rate of 1%, but if there's a significant outbreak in a community, the mortality rate can approach 50%. I'm not surely why, uh, sure why, but I suspect because if there's a significant outbreak, um, the number of victims uh, surpasses the uh, community's availability of healthcare resources to care for them. So what about special airborne precautions? Again, we talked about the, um, the diseases, uh, SARS, MERS, and uh, novel influenza-like viruses. Um, these patients, um, uh, or these times when there is an outbreak, uh, we should expect dispatch to uh, solicit travel uh, history as well as uh, other uh, questions such as, is there a fever or symptoms of viral illness? And if a uh, patient uh, rules in based upon the dispatch uh, survey questions, then the crew should be advised of need for PPE. Um, for you as an EMS provider, uh, be aware uh, of infectious disease outbreaks in the world, um, you know, and uh, be prepared to uh, listen for and follow CDC as well, well as World uh, Health Organization warnings about uh, disease outbreaks. Uh, airplanes can get patients anywhere in this world within uh, 24 hours, so a patient who was in uh, Egypt uh, two days ago could be in our community now with, uh, with MERS. Uh, if you uh, have reason to suspect these illnesses, uh, assess the patient at least uh, from six feet away or more bef uh, and don your PPE and minimize the number of providers uh, making direct patient contact. Um, uh, and this should all be considered as part of uh, scene safety and scene setup. PPE, uh, doorway evaluation um, is appropriate. Uh, minimize patient contact. Um, the uh, publication suggests an N95 mask. Our protocol is a surgical mask because of short-term exposure. And again, healthcare institutions may use PAPRs. Um, use long gloves, uh, impervious gowns, shoe covers, and face shield or mask with, uh, with goggles. Uh, consider double gloving. And then again, practice uh, putting the equipment on and taking it off uh, before you have an event where you need it. Um, so if there is an outbreak um, and we have reason to worry about this, the, any of these illnesses in our community, we should start practicing again how we doff and don uh, PPE. For patient care, uh, surgical mask on the patient, uh, tissue for uh, patient secretions, uh, minimize airway interventions, and if we have to provide any intervention, make sure we're uh, wearing a face shield or a mask and a goggle. And again, we, if we're going to intubate the patient, use our RSI procedures. Um, when we transport the patient, we should notify the receiving hospital the need for the isolation room, and again, turn that vent fan on, uh, try to get some of the air exhausted out of the vehicle. Vehicle decon, uh, it, again, it's remove any de uh, gross contamination and then clean and disinfect the medical equipment and gurney utilizing appropriate uh, agents. Um, what we have uh, identified as appropriate agents as virucidal uh, are 
perfectly suitable for deconning the vehicle and the equipment um, for this uh, class of patients. So finally, the last thing we talk about are the uh, Ebola virus diseases and viral hemorrhagic fever. Uh, and these illnesses are generally uh, spread via, via blood and body fluids. Uh, loss of fever is usually spread via rat urine, but human to human transmission is possible, particularly during outbreaks. Um, so uh, if there's any concern about loss of fever, we should be aware of it. For me, loss of fever is probably the least likely of these illnesses that we'll see in the States. Um, again, from dispatching perspective, screen those calls and I advise the um, uh, responding crew of any symptoms. Uh, we did this during the Ebola outbreak and um, again, if you have suspicion that the, the uh, patient may have Ebola or is at risk for any of these illnesses, uh, we should minimize contact until um, uh, we've had a chance to don PPE and we set up the scene and we should really do, make every attempt to minimize the number of providers making direct patient contact. Uh, for PPE, uh, we want to uh, wear uh, mask, uh, face shield, goggles, and head cover. Um, the recommendations uh, in the, in the uh, publication are similar to ours in that it's a surgical mask, but it's a surgical mask with a face shield um, or goggles. And there's also a recommendation that we put on head covers. Uh, we should use um, uh, double gloves, uh, use impervious gown or coveralls and shoe covers. Uh, and then we should practice stuffing and donning our PPE um, before we have any of these runs. From a patient care perspective, put a mask on the patient. If the patient is ambulatory, uh, consider uh, having the patient uh, putting on a pair of impervious coveralls and gloves. It could be one of those cases where uh, you stay six or more feet back, you uh, uh, toss over to the patient what they need to put on, have them put it on before you enter the room. If the patient is debilitated, um, then you're more likely to have to gown up and go in and care directly for the patient, at which point you can then uh, help uh, contain the patient either with a shroud or uh, any other uh, adult uh, undergarment necessary to contain body fluids. Put an absorbent mat on the gurney, uh, use a, an emesis bag, and, and um, do what you can to contain the body fluids. Take the time to package the patient correctly, which would then minimize the risk for contaminating your vehicle or uh, passing on any infectious agent to uh, care providers. Uh, and then avoid interventions um, that require uh, nebulized medications uh, or IV access. Uh, consider use of oral medications or intranasal medications. So if the patient is vomiting, um, you know, it may be inappropriate to try to start an IV, but uh, oral Zofran may be a good, um, a good treatment for the patient. Um, notify the uh, receiving hospital of need for isolation rooms uh, and uh, give them as quick a notification as possible because to set up for a patient who's got possible Ebola or hemorrhagic fever takes time. Uh, also be aware that uh, certain hospitals uh, may be designated as receiving hospitals for these patients. So when we were looking at the Ebola uh, scare, Ohio State was the designated receiving hospital. Uh, next in line, I believe, was Mount Carmel West. Um, but uh, in, in a circumstance where we're worried about uh, one of these uh, hemorrhagic fevers, generally uh, there is a system in place for uh, hospitals to be designated as receiving centers. For uh, vehicle decon, it's the same thing. Uh, remove any gross uh, contamination, clean with appropriate disinfectants. Uh, when you have uh, patients of this uh, or suffering any of these illnesses, there will be designated uh, containers um, for uh, placement of linens and uh, utilized uh, PPE, as well as uh, some equipment. Some of our equipment may be thrown away rather than. Uh, uh, decontaminated. So uh, anticipate that uh, when it comes time to clean up, uh, you have to aggressively clean your vehicle, but there will also be uh, designated containers uh, to put um, used equipment and, and so on. So final comments. Um, always have high suspicion of infectious disease and when uh, appropriate use uh, PPE. Uh, be aware of infectious disease outbreaks and populations at risk. Um, use proper techniques for donning and doffing PPE. You know, it doesn't uh, make a lot of sense to, to, to gown up and be prepared to take, a high risk, take care of a high-risk patient and then uh, not know how to take the equipment off or the uh, PPE off without contaminating yourself or others. Uh, notify the receiving hospital of the need for isolation. Give them plenty of time to uh, set up. 
uh, use the approved disinfectants and cleansers, and then consider using a PPE checklist, particularly when donning and doffing uh, PPE for higher threat illnesses. So if you're talking about the special respiratory protection or the patients that may have a viral hemorrhagic fever, um, using a checklist will assist um, getting the equipment on and off in the correct order, and you may actually need to have someone who uses the check or stands there with the checklist and calls out the steps as you do it. So I, that's all I have for this. I appreciate your time and attention. If you have any questions, please uh, submit them there uh, via Workplace. Thank you. Mm -hmm.